consider 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 through 10, that we might hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. Can you say amen? amen. Are you ready? If you're still looking, say, wait a minute. Well, God, that's half the church. We got to wait for you. You online, find me so you can read this. I don't want you to just watch me minister. I want you to have a personal experience with your Bible until it becomes familiar to you. So look for that scripture, 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 10. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Wow, how long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king amongst his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake. Look at that. And Samuel did that. See, that's where we lose it. We hear what God says, but we don't do what God says do. Samuel did that which the Lord spake. He was scared, but he did that which the Lord spake. He was intimidated, but he did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Ain't that something when you're such a prophet that a city trembles when you come? Comest thou peacefully? And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. Can you say amen? Go back to the first verse. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn? Let's just let that sink in. How long will thou mourn for Saul? I have rejected him. Fill thine horn with oil and go. That's all I need. I want to talk about a heart full of grief and a horn full of oil. A heart full of grief and a horn full of oil. A heart full of grief and a horn full of oil. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. Anoint us with oil. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Thank you for the opportunity for those online and in the building to embrace your word. 
We come in covenant with your word today, total agreement contractually with your word today, that it might be strength, that it might be meat, that it might be guidance, that it might be direction, that it might be nourishment for our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, with all the wind you can muster, shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I need to, I need to tip up on this text very gently. I don't want to disturb anything because this is not a congregational conversation. Shh. This is a private conversation between God and his prophet. Only the Holy Spirit has allowed us to eavesdrop on this conversation. Uh, I can't believe it. Samuel is in tears. He is weeping profusely. He is sobbing intensely. His heart has been riveted. His countenance has fallen, not Samuel. Samuel is a prophet of God, born out of the dead womb of Hannah, designed by God in a deal that he made with a barren woman that if he would give her a child, she would give it to him. And Samuel belongs to God. And God has known him all of his life. And God has raised him all of his life. And service to God is all that he knows. Samuel has pronounced judgment on entire nations and they were destroyed. He is not a wimp. He is not broken. He is not shattered. He is not easily deterred. Samuel is a strong prophet. In my opinion, he is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, prophets of the Old Testament. He is powerful. I give him such high ratings because he prophesies through life and he prophesies even through death. Samuel was used of God from the very onset as an embryo to his death and beyond the grave. He is God's man. Full of faith and power and to see him like this is utterly staggering. It is amazing because just a moment ago, he was standing before Saul, the first king of Israel, and pronounced judgment on him with some fierceness and a courageous audacity that is staggering. Imagine if God were to send you to the king or the president or the premier of a country to pronounce judgment on him. Behold, your kingdom shall be rent from you. He was strong as a lion in the face of the king. Now he whimpers like a lamb. But is that not what being an adult is all about? The ability to know when to be a lion? and when to be a lamb. He's strong enough to execute the word of the Lord without fear or without favor or reprisal from a soul that could have him killed. And yet he is so tender that he walks away from Saul and weeps like a baby. And I, now I see why God chose him because he's strong enough to execute judgment and tender enough to weep for Saul. Saul saw him roar like a lion, but he never heard him whimper like a lamb. Only we are allowed to see the prophet collapse up under the weight of being anointed. <laughs> The weight of glory that is upon us is not necessarily physical weight like in a gym. It's the weight of responsibility. 
everybody who has the weight of responsibility understands that it's heavy to be in charge. <laughs> heavy is the head of he that wears the crown. Samuel is weeping. He does not execute Saul, judgment on Saul because he dislikes him. He executes judgment on Saul because God said, do it. And then he weeps. And he weeps. And he weeps because it was Saul that anointed it was Samuel that anointed Saul to be king in the first place. He is invested in Saul. And anytime you invest in something and it goes wrong, it's painful. Anybody can talk about you because they don't have no investment in you. Oh, you didn't get that. <laughs> That's too good. Anybody can talk about you when they have no investment in you, but when you have invested and poured in and planted and mentored and established and consecrated and set aside, it breaks your heart to see him go down. And Samuel, for the first time in the Bible, is grief-stricken. And it is not his grief that has disturbed the Lord because God created us to have emotions. Emotions are not our enemy as long as they don't control our decisions. <laughs> it would be different if he was so emotional that he wouldn't tell him what God said. But he told him what God said. Emotions are not driving Saul, Samuel. They are not driving him, but he cannot de detach himself from how he feels. So God is not angry because he weeps. God is not angry because he is grief-stricken. God does not challenge him for feeling the way he feels. It's just, how long? How long will you mourn for that which I have rejected? In other words, God is saying, you should have overcome your grief by now. And now I've had to come down, you had to go down and talk to Saul, now I have to come down and talk to you. Because you have grieved too long. I should warn those of you that are watching and those of you that are here, this is not a regular message. This is a prophetic word. I know it is a prophetic word. I'm carrying it in the womb of my spirit like it is a prophetic word. How long will you weep? How long will you be bitter? How long will you be angry? How long will you be destitute? How long will you sob and mourn and walk around enraged? I have made my decision. It is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Grief. No one escapes it. No one escapes it. Not the rich, not the poor. Not the famous, not the infamous. How, no one escapes grief in life. So I ask myself, what is grief? What, what is grief? Let's, let's define grief. Grief is a natural response to loss. It's the emotional suffering you feel when something or someone you love is taken away from you. Often the pain of loss can feel overwhelming. You may have all kinds of unexpected emotions from shock to 
anger. You wouldn't think that anger would be a part of grief, but it is. You can be angry. You can have disbelief. You can have guilt. You can have profound sadness. All of that is just a part of grieving. Now, grief does not reserve itself for the mourning of the dead. Now, don't just think that. Don't, you don't have to roll a casket in front of the room for you to know grief. We all know that grief hangs out with death, but they are not married. It is a mistake to compartmentalize, get my tongue straight, compartmentalize grief with graves. There isn't a person listening to me in the building or online today who hasn't encountered grief. You've lost somebody. You've been through some things. You've endured some things. You've, you, you, maybe it was the loss of an opportunity. And you grieve over it. Uh, the, so maybe you were planning to be in the Olympics and, and, and you were denied and you grieve over it. Maybe you were promised any, uh, a promotion and you didn't get it and you grieved over it. Maybe you lost a job and you didn't get it and you grieved over it. Maybe you lost your house and, 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 you, and you grieve over it. Maybe a flood came in and washed away all your artifacts and you are in a state of grief and anger and disbelief and you have all kinds of emotions. Maybe it was the slow, agonizing disintegration of a relationship that was once a source of love, and now it is a source of pain. There is not a person in this room that hasn't had this feeling. There is no injection for grief, no medication for grief. You can't go to the physician and then prescribe you something for grief. You, you can't get a treatment or a therapy or a massage and get rid of grief. Your heart aches. The pain is real and intense. The agony of having a child or parent living in prison is grief. No tear ducts will go unused in this life. God did not waste his creative capacity when he created tear ducts. He knew you would cry. The moment the doctor slapped your bottom, you came out of your mama crying. They knew you were alive because you cried. There is no way around it. It doesn't matter how intellectual you might be, how attractive, how wealthy, or even, or even, or even, or even, or even how spiritual you may be. You can't just pray in the spirit and dismiss grief. It has to run a course. It has to run a path. You can't just quote scriptures and drive it away. You can't just wear holy clothes and drive it away. You can't just talk in tongues and drive it away. Grief without discrimination comes to everybody. Don't let these deep people deceive you that they are so spiritual they don't know what it is to have grief. They do know what it is to have grief. I know when this clip is played, there's going to be people on there, if you walk in the spirit, you won't have grief. I don't feel grief. The joy of the Lord is my strength. They are liars. Every last one of them are absolute liars. They are liars. They are liar, lie, lie, lie. Pants on fire. You. It gets on my nerves. It bothers me, these people who walk around acting like they don't feel anything. They don't go through anything. They don't have any fluctuations. They don't have any upheavals. They don't. It bothers me to hear them lie and to lie in the name of the Lord. Isaiah 53, 3 said, he is despised, talking about Jesus, and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. 
They talk about Jesus, a man of sorrow. They're talking about the God man, a man of sorrow. They're talking about God incarnate in flesh, a man of sorrow. We're talking about the divine and the human tied and fused together in an unexplainable way, and still he is a man of sorrows. And he is acquainted with grief. <laughs> Jesus and grief had a relationship. <laughs> and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We did esteem him, smitten of God. <laughs> he was despised. And we esteemed him not. He knew what it was like to have grief. He goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he prays and cries out to the Father until his sweat glands open up and secretes blood. He is acquainted with grief. When the masses left him, he turned to his innermost court of disciples and said, will thou leave me also? Because when you start losing stuff, you think you're going to lose everything. You're, you're not just upset over what you lost. You start looking at what you got like you could be next. If Jesus was acquainted with grief, we deceive ourselves if we try to project the impression that it has not come by to visit all of our lives. Often it comes unannounced. It doesn't warn. It wasn't invited. You didn't plan for it. You didn't expect it. You just walk into it. The phone rings. The text comes. You get something in the mail and oops, there it is. While grief is common to all of us, prolonged grief can be physically, spiritually, and emotionally debilitating. Prolonged grief can affect your health, can affect your mind. It can throw off course your other relationships until mommy isn't there for the rest of the kids because of the kids she lost. It can affect the next relationship you have because you really haven't gotten over your past relationship. <laughs> My wife and I were counseling a couple that were, were just, forgive this term, hell-bent on getting a divorce. So angry and so upset, I'm going to divorce and I'm going to walk away and it's so and 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 they kept talking and one of them kept saying to the other and accusing them and attacking them and attacking them and attacking them. I said, if you are going to get divorced and I'm not counseling you to and I don't want you to, but if you are going to get a divorce, a divorce is like a wedding. Nobody gets married to be miserable and nobody gets divorced to be miserable. What good is it getting a divorce if you're still going to be mad, if you're still going to be angry, if you're still going to be writing notes and sending messages and wondering, did you see him and who was he with and what was going on? You are not divorced. I don't care what the paper says. You are still married. You're still married. How long? God says. In our text, we're listening and God challenging the lingering grief of one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. In our text, we're listening at God, not only challenging the lingering grief of a great prophet, but he asked him, how long will you mourn over a door I have closed? and a king I have rejected. How long will you mourn over a marriage that's over? A job that's gone, a house that's been removed, a girlfriend that left, a boyfriend that left. How long, how long will you be angry and guilty and frustrated and bitter and build your whole life 
around something that is dead. I love how David grieved. He grieved over the death of his child with Bathsheba. As long as the child lived, he prayed and prayed and prayed. And when they told him the child was dead, he got up, he washed his face, he changed his clothes, and he went on with his life. There are some times in your life that you got to get up, wash your face, change your clothes, go on with your life. Life is too short for you to hang around the cemetery grieving over who didn't want you, who left you, who denied you, the job you didn't get, the business you lost, the house that you didn't close on. You cannot spend the rest of your life. How long? You would be shocked at the people who get up every morning with a heart full of grief. If you talk to them very long, you will hear it. For out of the mouth flows the issues of the heart. And it comes out in their speech, and it comes out in their language, and it comes out in that snappy way they confront you, and how they handle you, and how they deal with you. And you think they're mean, they're not really mean, they're still grieving. How long? If you can't say amen, say ouch. How long does it take to get over a person, a place, a thing? How long will you put your future on hold, mulling over your past? How long will you lay here on this ground? Samuel, don't you understand who you are? I did not create you for you to get stuck. I came to get somebody unstuck. I came to get somebody free. I came to get somebody back up on their feet. You cannot spend your rest of your life grieving over who didn't love you, who didn't raise you, who wasn't there for you, who gave you away, who gave you up for adoption. You can't spend it. You're 40 years old. You can't spend it. How long? Samuel, you're stuck. And no matter whose church you join, and who you hear preach, and where you go, and how much you fast, God did not create you to be stuck with a heart full of grief. I call it atrophy. I call it atrophy. When you stay in a position too long, and you don't move. If I stay like this long enough, when I get ready to straighten up, I won't be able to straighten up because my spine will develop atrophy. Atrophy is a, a body tissue or an organ. It wastes away, especially as a result of degeneration of cells, or it becomes vegetative and fails to evolve without exercise, the muscles deteriorate, and what started out as a decision becomes a paralysis. I got a word for somebody who has got atrophy. You are paralyzed. You've been stuck. You've been stuck not for weeks, not for months, but for years. You've been stuck. You shout about great things coming, but you can't receive great things coming because you still got atrophy over old things that you can't get rid of. And you have lost your ability to straighten yourself up. You have got spiritual atrophy. Who am I talking? to make some noise in this place because God is getting ready to shake you. He's getting ready to put you in therapy. He's getting ready to open up a door. He's getting ready to open up a door. He's getting ready to open a door until you get flexible, until you can move again, until you can function again. You have atrophy. It's why you can't fall in love. It's not that there's nobody to love. It's that you haven't gotten over who you used to love. And
and you pray for God to send help and you pray for God to send opportunities and you pray for God to send increase but you can't receive it when it comes because you have developed atrophy. In the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 13, there is a woman who was bowed over and bent out of shape and could in no wise lift up herself because she stayed in this position too long. How long will you be angry? How long will your blood boil every time you see their image? How long will you keep checking their Facebook page? How long will you keep investigating somebody who's not even thinking about you anymore and you are an undercover agent trying to see where they're going and who they're talking to and who they took a picture with? It wasn't you. around the tomb of what didn't work out. I was doing a, 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 what do you call it, Instagram interview with Devon Franklin, and he was asking me about when I did the talk show. He said, when I didn't get renewed for the second term, he said, were you upset? I said, absolutely. He said, were you disappointed? I said, completely. He said, how do you manage things that don't work out? I said, I moved on. Because I know God, and I know that if God would have meant for that to work for 10 years, he would have made it work for 10 years. And I have enough confidence in him to know that if he wanted it to work, it would work. And if he didn't work, I got up, I washed my face, and I kept on going. And I said, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. I had the experience. I got to learn things I would have never learned. I got to meet people I would have never met. And I was the first clergy to be on daytime television, on mainstream network, and somebody's going to come behind me, and they're going to do it longer and bigger and better, but I was the first, and I'm happy to have been the first. You got to change the way you talk to yourself about what happened in your life or you will get stuck. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but the Lord sent me here to cause you to get a relief. The Lord sent me here to be your spiritual therapist to get you back on course again. You are not yourself. You were not created for this. You were not created to feel like this. You were not created to be stuck like this. God didn't bring you out of your mother's womb to get to this point in your life and develop atrophy. God wants your nerves and cells and tissues and blood and bone and muscles to move. Somebody shout move. Somebody shout move. Somebody shout move. That's what you ought to say to grief. That's what you ought to say to fear. That's what you ought to say to anger. That's what you ought to say to disbelief. Move. I will not spend the rest of my life hanging around the cemetery of what could have been, what should have been, what ought to have been. Why seek ye the living amongst the dead? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And in my Maya Angelou voice, and still I rise. <laughs> Somebody practice it and say, and still I rise. You ought to clap your hands and praise your God and begin to celebrate 
Look at what you've been through and still I rise. Look at what you endured and still I rise. Look at what you overcame and still I rise. Look at what left and still I rise. Look at what happened to you and still I rise. I was adopted, but still I rise. I was wounded, but still I rise. Grandma raised me and still I I'm leaving, I'm leaving 60 seconds for old-fashioned hand-clapping, foot-stopping. Them, but look at them and say, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Type it on the line. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Type it on the line. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Say it to yourself. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up while you can. Get up while you can. Get up while you can move. Get up while you can move. Get up while you can move. Get up, get up, get up. Jesus said to the woman who was bowed over, he didn't even heal her. He just talked to her. He said, woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He didn't say you're going to be loose. He didn't say I loose you. She was already loose. She had atrophy. She'd been bent over so long that it had become normal. How long will you mourn over Saul? until it has become normal to be angry and normal to be bitter. And when you are stuck, you draw people that are stuck so that they can stick with you. Because once you get stuck, you want stuck to be normal. Anybody happy, you push them away. You start fraternities of stuck people. When you look around you and all of your friends are talking about their ex-husbands, there's something wrong with your circle. It's time for you to get up. It's time for you to change. If everybody you know has lost their job, you're in the wrong circle. If everybody you know has had a nervous breakdown, you're in the wrong circle. If I had a nervous breakdown, I don't want to hang around other people that had a nervous breakdown. Put me in a room full of people who are mentally sound so I can see what normal looks like. How long? Glory to God. I feel a breakthrough coming in this place. I don't know who it's for. I don't know who I'm talking to. But God is not going to leave you in the state you have been in. Because the pain is starting to be your norm. The bitterness is starting to be your norm. The anger is starting to be your norm. And that's too much power to let anybody or anything have over you. I will not lose my mind over a show, over a job, over a house, over a position. I will rock and still I rise. And still I rise. Say it again. And still I rise. There are literally people in this room who are still stuck with spiritual atrophy over things that people did who are dead. They did and you was hurt at the funeral. You mad at the funeral. Rolling your eyes at a casket. They're dead, you get to live, 
and you're not going to live and act like you're dead, if you're not going to live, you get in the box and let them get up and live. If they had a chance to live, they wouldn't be rolling their eyes at you. Let me tell you what I figured out a long time. If you can make it without me, oh, you didn't hear what I said. If you can make it without me, and let me tell you, I might be dying and crying and broke all the pieces, but as soon as I see you going on, if you can make it, you got the same memories I do. If you can make it without me, I can make it without you. I'll get another job. I'll get another house. I'll get another life. I'll get another career. I'll make another choice. But you will not find me for 20 years, bowed over 18 years, and I can, the devil is a lie. How long will you mourn over what I have rejected? Note to self, make peace with your past. I could have, I could have processed it like Oprah did her show for 30 years. And look at me. I only got one in and it was over. I could have turned on the TV set and every time I talked to her, come on, I could have started crying. Or I could have said, look at what I got to do. Look at what I got to experience. Look at what I got to have. Look at what I got an opportunity to do. That's why I don't understand how people preach about Peter walking on the water. All they talk about is him sinking. Get out of my face. Peter got to walk on the water. He's the only disciple in the whole Bible that got to walk on the water with Jesus, and all y'all can do is talk about he began to sing. He didn't even finish sinking. He just began to sing. Let me tell you something. Nobody, not Paul, not Thomas, not Bartholomew, not James, not John, not none of them could say that they'd ever walked on the water, but Peter got to step off the boat and walk on the water. I'm glad I had the experience. I'm glad I had the opportunity. I'm glad I... I'm glad I got to know such love. I'm glad I had a mother to miss. Some people never met their mother. Some people had a bad mother. Some people hated their mother. I was blessed with something to lose. Yeah. Healing begins when you change the way you tell yourself your story. So God comes down from heaven and said, I guess I'm going to have to come get you. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> have you ever had God come down and look at you and say, what are you doing? <laughs> I have. I've had the Lord come down and speak to me and say, why are you acting crazy? Why are you crying? Most of the time God asks why is over how we handle our emotions. God told Cain, why is that countenance fallen? The king told Nehemiah, why is your countenance fallen? The angels told Mary, why seek ye the living amongst the dead? God walked through the garden to Adam, where are thou? What are you doing? Samuel, how long? How long? You weeping over uh, Saul longer than the children of Israel weeped over Moses. 
They gave Moses 30 days. They said, all right, I'm going to eat ice cream for 30 days. Ice cream and Oreo cookies for 30 days. I'm going to cry till I run out of tears for 30 days. After that, God said to, to, spoke to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And they got up and they went on into the promise land. You got a promised land waiting on you. You got a promised land waiting on you. Can I go deeper? Grief lives in the past. Grief lives in the past. It breathes old memories. That's its oxygen. It breathes old memories. Grief lives in the past, but grace Grace looks forward to the future. That means grace and grief are fighting in you, for you. Grief is trying to keep you tied to the millstone of what happened. And grace is down there with this welding equipment trying to cut the chain. Grace liberates, grief incarcerates. Grief so incarcerates that you can get married again and you're not married again. <laughs> Because the first time he says something to remind you of your ex-husband, you flip absolutely out. <clears throat> I just asked you what time dinner was, and you threw a butcher knife at me over that? He don't know you're not throwing at him, you're throwing at your ex. You're a polygamist. You're a polygamist. I don't care what the paper says. You're a polygamist. You are still married to your past, your old job, your old life, your old parents, your old this, your old that, your old house. Everything. I used to live over on White Rock Lake, and when I moved out of that house, I think it was about at least six years before I ever even drove past it again. Somebody said, all the memories and all those years you lived in the house, well, don't you ever go by there and drive past it? I said, no. Why would I go back there? I sold it. It's gone. I made a good profit off of that house. I profited too much off that house to go back and visit it as a place of defeat. What did you profit out of what you've been through? God will never use what you lost. He will always use what you have left. Oh God, God, I'm preaching to somebody. Who am I preaching to? Hit me up, say something to me. If I'm preaching to you, make some noise. If the Holy Spirit is, yeah, yeah, give me some. Give me some, give me some, give me some. But that's only half of the message. <clears throat> that's a heart full of grief. What got him up was a horn full of oil. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will thou mourn for Saul, saying I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. Fill thine horn. God said, I want your horn to be as full of oil as your heart has been full of grief. Fill thine horn with oil. Lift your hands for a moment. 
just for a moment, lift your hands in his presence and just start worshiping him right out of your mouth right now. Oh, we bless you. We honor you, we adore you. We adore you, we honor you, we lift you up. We exalt you, we glorify you, we magnify your name. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. How excellent is, how excellent is, how excellent is, how excellent is thy name. I lift my horn up, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the thrusting in my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up. And make me whole. Here's my cup. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. I've been so thirsty. This thirsting in my soul. Bread of heaven. Feed me till. Glory. Here's my cup. Fill it up and make me. Whew. Go. Go fill your horn with oil. Say it with me. Go fill your horn with oil. Say it again. Go fill your horn with oil. Say it again. Go fill your horn with oil. You cannot make decisions with a heart full of grief. You need a horn full of oil. You got to be more intentional about your worship life. You got to be more intentional about it. I don't mean you feel like worshiping. You may not feel like worshiping, but you got to get in the routine of worshiping as an exercise, a therapy of releasing you from the atrophy of being stuck in your life. Let me tell you, when you start worshiping God, the Spirit of God will come in and release you and heal you and renew you. And God said to Samuel, the only way you're going to get up from here is to fill your horn with oil. I told you last week, go get your own oil. This is continuing the conversation about how do I get my own oil? How do I get my own oil when you can only get it from God? The oil that matters, only God secretes. They say the best way to get over your ex is get up. Well, don't, don't quote it like. <laughs> I almost forgot I was in church. Pray for me. Intercede. Be my intercessor for a minute. I forgot for a minute, I had it just for a minute, just for a minute, it came to me. I forgot how it ended, I started it, I forgot how it ended, and then when I thought about it, how it ended, I thought, <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't use that. But, but that's what they said, that don't work. <laughs> I lost them on that one, Jesus. Help me get it back. That, that does not work. All you do is bring your trouble with you. All you do is bring your trouble into the next relationship. So you have to go to the shock absorber. Jesus is a shock absorber. And you have to say, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the fasting of my soul. 
bread, bread of heaven, feed me till I'm tired of wanting, Lord. I'm tired of wanting, Lord. I'm tired of wanting, Lord. Here's my cup. <laughs> Fill it up and make me whole. You go to church, but you don't worship in your house. You don't worship in your car. You don't worship in your spirit. You have to fill your horn with oil. Can I go deeper? The oil is what the church is lacking. We got great buildings. We got great preachers. We got great pastors. We got more degrees than a th thermometer. We have no oil. We have no oil. We've forgotten how to get lost in the presence of God. We've forgotten to allow the anointing to overwhelm us. We have lost our oil, and that's why we're stuck with atrophy and bitterness and anger. You need oil. You need oil. You need oil. You need fresh oil. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to overshadow you. You need the oil. You need oil. You need to, he said, the only way you're going to get up is to fill your horn with oil. The only way you're going to get up from here is to fill your horn with oil. Fill your horn with oil. Shout it. Fill your horn with oil. Shout it again. Again. Shout it again. Shout it again. I'm going to show you this and then I'm going to close. There is a revelation in the horn and the oil. The horn was taken from an animal. So, in order to have a horn, you had to shed blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The horn that God is talking about is literally an animal's horn that had to be cut away. That's sacrifice. In order to be anointed, there must be sacrifice. Come on here. Did you really think that you were going to be an anointed vessel for God and the devil not attack you at all? Did you think you was just going to go skipping through the tulips the rest of your life and not run into anything to overthrow you? Then you didn't believe in your own mission. If you believed in what God gave you, you would understand this attack is a part of the warfare. And sometimes, there has to be sacrifice to be anointed. So God said, don't fill a glass with oil. Here he says, fill a horn with oil. You could fill a glass with oil and not cut anything. But in order to get a horn, there has to be bleeding. I want to talk to bleeding people. I want to talk to bleeding people. Are you listening at me? I want to talk to bleeding people. You that are on Facebook, you that are following me on YouTube, you that are following me on the app, I'm talking to you. I'm talking about the way you've been bleeding. I'm talking about the way you've been stuck. I'm talking about the way you've had atrophy. I'm talking about how things are not moving forward in your life and you become comfortable to be bent over and stuck. You've been stuck so long that God has come down to ask you, how long are you going to live your life back there? There has to be sacrifice for where you are going. He said, watch, watch, fill your horn with oil and go. 
The association between the blood and the oil continues through the whole Bible. First blood, then oil. First blood, then oil. There will always be first blood, then oil. First blood, then oil. Once you have accepted Christ as your Savior, that's blood. You now receive the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's oil. It's divine order. The oil won't flow where there is no sacrifice. I'm almost, I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. The oil won't flow in your comfort zone. The oil won't flow. I want to be anointed. I want a double portion. I want, I want, I want. Shut up. Because... The oil will not flow where there is no blood. That's why the book of Hebrews said, ye have not yet resisted unto blood. Fill your horn with oil and go. I will not speak to you about this again, Samuel. You didn't even exist. Your birth is a miracle. I created you according to my own good pleasure. And now I am not pleased with you being stuck because I am not through with you yet. Your story doesn't end because you and Saul have separated. I know you're hurt, I get it. I created the feelings that you're stuck in. I know you're grieving. I know you're angry. I know you're bitter. I know you thought that he was going to continue to be king, but he is not. Fill your horn with oil. I got a plan, man. I can't work my plan if you're in love with what was. Watch this and I'll close. I already got next waiting on you. I could never accomplish my purpose in the earth as long as Saul is king because Saul doesn't have the bloodline through which Jesus will come. I have a long-term strategy. You have a temporary pain. In order for the son of David, who is Jesus, to come, David must come to reign on the throne. I moved Saul for a reason. Fill your horn with oil and go. If I would have meant for you to stay on that job, you would have still had it. If I would have meant for that business to work, it would have still worked. Learn what you can learn from it and fill your horn with oil and go. 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 Say it. Fill your horn with oil and go. Say it again. Fill your horn with oil and go. Which, when, when was the last time you filled your horn with oil? Till you, wait, wait, wait. Till you got lost in the presence of God. Till you forgot about what you had on. Until you messed up your makeup. Until you shook down your hair. Until you got lost in the presence of God and you really got immersed in the Holy Spirit and God really cleaned you out. 
really cleaned you out, cleaned you out, cathartic. The Bible says none but the pure in heart shall see God. The word pure is where we get catheter, where God cleans you out, where he cleans you out. When was the last time you had a gully washing, soul quenching, thirst renewing, power of the Holy Spirit to gush through you and you were more than somebody who goes to church on Sunday. Fill your horn with oil and go. Fill your horn with oil and go. Say it again. Fill your horn with oil and go. Say it again. Fill your horn with oil and go. This is why I'm preaching this and I'm going to close. Some people get so stuck in dysfunction that it appears to be normal. And you lose who you were created to be because of who you've had to be. You've lost your personality, your giving spirit, your loving spirit, your laughing spirit, your curious spirit, your inquisitive spirit, you're careful, you're worried, you're paralyzed, you're stuck. The joy has gone out of your eyes. The gleam and brightness has come out of your face. And you are God's man and God's woman, and you are stuck in spiritual atrophy. And to all of that, God is saying, you have had a heart full of grief and you need a horn full of oil. Sit with me, let me have a ministry moment with you as best I can. Brothers, let me hear you. Can I be honest with you? Nobody gets stuck like we do. Nobody gets stuck like we do. We get stuck because we internalize everything. And the only emotion we're given permission to feel is anger. At least women get theirs out. They open up, they cry, they vent, they get on the phone, they talk to each other, they do stuff. We do nothing but hold it in and develop dysfunctions. We have not given ourselves permission to feel hurt, so we immediately convert it to anger. We internalize the anger. And really we're just grieving. We're grieving over fathers who never paid us any attention or never raised us or never acknowledged us or mothers who were overbearing or overwhelming or treated us as substitute husbands. And I'm going to try to help you because these women make the mistake of marrying angry men because women always think they can fix you and they want to be your oil, but they can't. And we go to church, but we don't really worship because we, don't, we think it's not masculine to really worship, so we sit. And we wonder why we're not being transformed. It's because our horn has no oil in it. 
We're bitter about what happened to us as boys. We're bitter about what happened to us in life, on jobs where we were not treated fairly. We're bitter about aging. We're bitter about all kinds of things that are happening to our lives, to our bodies, to our families, to our finances. We're bitter because we don't feel appreciated. We're bitter because we don't feel acknowledged. We're bitter because we gave ourselves to people who never gave themselves back to us. We're bitter because we have a love language that the people we love don't understand. Am I coming down your street? And we go to church, but church is not coming to us. This is not just a feminine issue. There are grieving men in this room who have little boy issues, fatherhood issues. There are grieving men in this room who are grieving about sons we lost, that we thought they would grow up and love us and they don't. There are grieving men in this room who feel rejected, not by the woman who left, but by the woman you got. And you're only staying in the house. You ain't married, you just stay there. But while you're staying there, you're grieving and you are self-medicating your own problems. And when I start talking about fill your horn with oil and the woman bowed out of shape and all that kind of stuff, it goes right over your head because you don't think I'm talking to you, I'm talking right to you. Now both the women and the men hear me good. If this message spoke to you and you know you got some work to do, just you, just you stand to your feet. Okay, you know what we need? Oh, that's almost everybody. I can almost see the people on the internet standing up. Somebody got their laptop on like this. <laughs> you know what the church needs universally? We need oil. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit to really come into our life in a vibrant and functional way. What does that mean, Bishop? Do I stop by Kroger's and get some oil? No, silly. The oil I'm talking about is the oil of the Holy Spirit. Now, nobody can put oil on you. You have to seek it. You have to seek God for a greater expression of his glory to fall in your life. I'm not gonna take long, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna ask both the men and the women and the children to open up your heart and you online. Since you have chosen to be online, this has gotta be real to you. You can't just watch it like it's a TV show. This ministry moment has to get in your living room. It has to come on your couch. It has to be at your kitchen table. Stop cooking. It has to get you right where you are. Put your coffee down and listen up. I'm talking to you. You're oilless and you're stuck. And before atrophy completely sets in and you end up dying a bitter old man or a bitter old woman, Hear ye the word of the Lord. The reason we have you to raise your hands is not because you're under arrest. That was a joke, you missed it. Don't laugh later, it's too late. It's, you messed it up. When the hands are open, you are defenseless. When the hands are open, it is symbolic of my heart is exposed. When the hands are open, you are in the position of receiving. And everyone who cared enough about your soul to stand up, I want you to lift your hands. And to the best of your ability, I know it's rusty, atrophy is set in. To the best of your ability, open up your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to have its way 
inside of you. This is going to get inside of you. This is, this is going to, this is going to be a moment of cleansing and purification as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes in, inside of you. You are not alone. The Spirit of God is here. And God wants you to be filled, not just in church, not just running down the aisle, but in your car, in your life. Because you don't feel fulfilled. You make good money, but you don't feel fulfilled. You got a nice car, but you don't feel fulfilled. You buy people stuff, but you don't feel fulfilled. You're miserable in your own skin and you're stuck. And God wants you to open your heart and talk to him. Open your mouth and talk to your father. Talk to your father, even if it's awkward, even if it feels weird, even if you have no point of reference, open your mouth because God is trying to fill your horn with oil. God it a bullshit. God is trying to fill your horn with oil. God is trying to fill your horn with oil. God is trying to fill you. Every empty crevice in your soul, God is trying to fill your horn with oil. And I can't make this happen. You have to open it up and let it happen. You have to, as an act of your will, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's yet near. Lift your hands and open your mouth to him. I can't hear you. And open your mouth to God and let him come into this room and let it come into this place. Come into this place. Come in and dwell with me and sit with me. Come into my living room. Come in and sit on me. Come into my anger. Come into my frustration and feel my heart with oil. I open my heart. I don't care if you're listening in the sound room. I don't care if you're listening backstage. If the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, lift your hands and let the Holy Spirit come in. He came in like a mighty rushing wind. He came in like a mighty rushing wind. And he began to flow. 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 He's flowing right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. Doors are creaking open. Doors are creeping open. Hearts are opening up. Hearts are opening up. Oh my God. Oh my God. I feel the presence of God coming down in this place. Rest on us, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome into this place. Welcome into this bro. Can vessel you desire? Come on, welcome him, welcome him. Welcome into this Welcome into my brokenness. Come on. Into this broken vessel. This broken vessel. You desire to abide. So I lift, and we lift our hearts as we offer up this praise unto Your name. Father, there's a flow of spirit in this place. There's a flow of spirit in this place. There's a flow of spirit in healing and restoration in this place. There are so many people in this room that need this word for different reasons. 
Some of them are grief stricken over loved ones. Some of them are grief stricken over relationships. Some of them are grief stricken over failures and disappointments and family members. And there's so many different kinds of grief in this room, but there's only one oil. Lord, let that oil flow in and saturate, not just till the service is over, but in the car, in the restaurant, in the house, in the hotel room, wherever this word is seen, let the oil flow. Now give him praise all over this building. Into this place. Welcome into this broken vessel. Into this. You desire to abound in the praise of Everybody in this room, whatever expression of praise or worship that you have that comes sincerely from your heart, let it out right now. Let it out right now. Let it flow right now. Let it flow right now. Let it flow right now. As we come to a close, I'm gonna bring you to a close in just a moment of our Sunday morning service. I want you to get back to sacrifice and away from convenience. I want you to make a special effort to be here Wednesday night. Some of you used to be midweek worshipers. It's time to make the sacrifice. Sacrifice is not just giving tithes and offerings. Sacrifice is giving time and energy and prioritizing the things of the spirit. You got an everyday devil and you got a once a week God. You can't just do it on Sunday. For where you are right now, you can't get therapy once a week. <laughs> Glory. We got to get prayer in your house. We got to get prayer in your house. Maybe y'all wouldn't argue so much if we had a little bit more prayer, a little bit more humility, a little bit more love, a little bit more peace in your house. In just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity, all of you that had envelopes to leave them on your way out, all of you that are online, and the Holy Spirit did a work in your life today, and you know it. And you know it. And you know it. It's a great moment to sow. I miss so much us hugging and gathering around the altar, but soon, I have in my heart, I love to run an old-fashioned three-day 
Holy Ghost revival. I really want to hear you. If I had three straight days like a, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night with you, like we used to, it would be absolutely amazing what we could get done. I'm tired of this once a week feeding. We need a breakthrough for the kinds of devils that we're fighting right now. We need a gully washing, come as you are, laying out all over the church, pray, prostrate in the presence of the Lord, letting God fill. God keeps talking to us about oil. He keeps talking to us about oil. He keeps talking, there's something that God wants to break in this place. It's starting to crack, but when it breaks, people are gonna be healed. When it breaks, people are gonna be set free. When it breaks, somebody's gonna take off and go to running. When it breaks, souls are gonna be at the altar. When it breaks, your children are gonna be saved. When it breaks, your house is gonna get a breakthrough. When it breaks, I'm gonna ride this thing till I break it. I'm gonna ride it till I break it. I'm gonna ride it till I break it. If I have to kick my shoes off and come in barefoot, I'm gonna break this spirit Hallelujah. The, what's wrong with the world right now is that we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We would stop all this fighting and all this bickering and all this dissension if we had more oil. I can feel God taking us somewhere. Can you feel God taking us somewhere? Can you feel God taking us somewhere? God is getting ready to take us somewhere. And I want you to be in on it. Every week I'm gonna keep working on this and working on this and working on this until yokes are broken, until chains pop, until prison doors fly open, until you escape until your joy comes back and your peace and your sense of gratification and fulfillment is full, there are some things God wants to do in you. There are some plans that God has in you. God doesn't want you to get stuck where you are. God's got a new thing He wants to do in your life. God wants a fresh thing, a fresh oil, and a fresh anointing to come upon you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I sense the Holy Spirit. He misses you. He misses the way you glorify Him. He misses your worship your praise. He misses that deeper gully washing, thirst quenching thing that he's done inside of you. And I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. Somebody shout revival. That's what America needs, revival. That's what Texas needs, revival. That's what the church needs, revival. Glory. you want to do God. Say it again, do what you want to do God. Do what you want to do God. Throw your hand up and say, do what you want to do God.
Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. 